<laughs> oh, hey YouTube. I thought I'd come and make a video before I do my meditations and go to bed. It's been a very good couple of days uh, since Christmas Eve. You know, I'm coming to realization about myself and I don't know, I, I, I've changed a lot, a whole lot. And and then I haven't changed that much, but it's things I didn't understand about myself. You know, um, those of you who've been following me for a while, you know uh, I'm a recovered, not recovering, recovered drug addict. But I thought I had really done something wonderful and oh man i i'm uh, free from crack cocaine and i'm this so thank you jesus and i can make it but the past few days i've been talking to my dear friend harold Tolliver, and even talking to queen uh that's uh one of my face uh book subscribers friends and now i i understand that i am addicted to something else which is much harder to get over than crack cocaine. I'm addicted to fear and anxiety. I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it stunned me when I realized that's what it was. It's an addiction. And it started a long time ago. And it's so normal. The last video I talked about it, but it's so normal for me to do that till I really didn't know I could stop it. I mean, but who else can stop it but me? But Harold has he like I tell you, he wrote a book called Powerful Quotes. And he had been reading some uh pages out of the chapter on love and fear and i didn't expect it to go that deep and to scratch my scalp so hard and it's healing but i said wow look at this and it brought many many tears to my eyes the condition i am in but i'm working my way out of just little by little i didn't realize how bad it was and I've been doing some studying about anxiety. Come to find out more women than men suffer from anxiety. And it's, it's for different reasons, but women are the weaker of the two uh, sexes. And, you know, it's, and men don't really worry. They don't worry about the children. I don't even think half of them worry about Bill. They just... You know, they worry about uh, their sex addiction, and that we, we know that's the one addiction that they have. But I'm working on this, and when I began to think about the fears that I have, I thought about in the beginning, you know, when we come here, birth, we are, and things that we're afraid of. When we come here, we've been in the dark womb for nine months and the light startles us i'm not gonna say we're afraid of it, but i know it startles us and then we've been held close and swaddled in our mother's arms and our mother's belly and we didn't have to um your arms all you know you're just in the womb and feel safe and here all of a sudden you don't have nothing holding you your arms and things are flinging so babies are afraid of falling that's why they jump like that like whoa i'm gonna fall so the fear starts there but oh i tell you mine i only thing i can go is uh tell you about the first one we were talking about the last couple of videos i made about uh movies and things that would uh make me afraid and then hell not hair <laughs> hell the church that i went to this holiness church that's all they preached about was hell everything you did was going you were going to go to hell and me being uh, four and five years old i didn't know nothing about sin 
I just know we're going to all burn up if you're a bad little girl. I didn't equate that with sin. But you're going to burn in hell forever and ever. And it's in hell underground. And in my mind, they, it was a hole. And I knew I was afraid because there were nights, plenty of nights, I wouldn't let my older sister go to sleep. I said, because uh, Jesus is going to come back and we got to be woke so she would she did the best she could stay up until i got sleepy and it's can you imagine a child doing that so i spent most of my childhood being afraid and then i was afraid in school the teachers would whoop you and stuff i was just a scary kid anyway <laughs> so it didn't take much for me to just go over the edge. I remember one time, and I'm grown when this happened. I, I was married, like 19, but we were at the, at the fair, and it was a tent, and they had a tent where, um, you, you know how you have your side shows. I go in with the rest of the kids from the church, and uh, they had this woman in a cage, and... They said that she was a wild woman, but she just had on her little bathing suit and everything. And they said for us to stay away from the cage because if we got too close, she would get angry and we, they didn't know what she might turn into. So I'm just sitting there and I was, you know, wasn't afraid. But then all of a sudden it got darker in the tent, under the tent, and then they started flashing strobe lights and I, i'm here that's in, in the 70s i didn't know nothing about a strobe light a church girl and the woman started holding on to the cage and, and lights flashing and cheating and, and then the cage just looked like they were breaking a loose and i'm just looking i said this woman she gonna tear up the cage and then i don't know how they did it but they flash and flash, and next thing you know, you saw parts of a gorilla coming. And then, and I said, "Wow, this this woman turned really turned into a gorilla." Next thing you know, it's a a real not a real a gorilla in that cage shaking, boy. And it, and next thing you know, the cage door was coming open. Honey, I was the first one out of that tent. I was out. And standing on the sidelines and just looking, almost tears in my eyes. And I couldn't believe that the rest of the people didn't come out. And the people I was with, I said, go really and ate them up. And they all finally, it looked like they all came out at the same time. And they were laughing at me. I, I end up, <laughs> I end up being the show because uh, nobody else was afraid. But man, so here I am. 18 or 19 is scared like that. So the fear is what I, uh, fear and anxiety. And, you know, it's hard to say which one is what, but what causes what. But I remember my mother, I, I, I didn't know gifts and things from stuff from God. And I, I, I saw visions and things for as long as I can remember. And like I heard, had the first conversation with God when I was in the third grade. But when I was 17, I had a vision of my mother in church. And I'm sitting on the front row in church. And I saw a pink casket at the front where your, your table is, a remembrance table. And I had my eyes closed, but I was not asleep. And I was curious of this casket. I said, well, who is this? And so I found myself walking up to the casket and looking in it. And my mother was in this casket, telling a pink gown. And when I saw it was her, I screamed and I screamed. And I remember the members of the church trying to calm me down. And my mother was there. And... You know, the service dismissed, but they, you know, got me calmed down enough for, to get me in the car. And we got home. My mother said, what did you see? I didn't want to tell her what I saw. She said, Mary, tell me. I'm not afraid. I told her. And she said, 
I'm not afraid. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I'm ready to go home and be with God. Do you know six months after that, my mother got a, a death sentence from the doctor. She had only six months to live. She had colon cancer. And she lived six and a half months after that. But uh, in September, that's when she started getting real bad. I mean, just, oh, they end up doing a colostomy on her. So I was the one that took care of her and cleaned her up and everything, bathed her. But school started that September. And I was, uh, it was my final year that following May. So I would go to school September. But I, I would cry in school. I just couldn't. I was worried about my mother. When school would be out, I'd run home. Then I'd get tired and I'd stop because you can't run all the way home. And I'd cry the rest of the way home. When I'd get about two blocks from the house, I'd straighten up my face and go in. Because I was, you know, the running and thing. I would think uh, she was dead. And i say, I want to be home when she died. So all of that anxiety and stuff. But... That is me when I'm 17 years old. And after she died, I just I had enough credit. So I didn't, I finished, I left school that October. She died October 10th. So I left school after she died. And then I went back and just got my diploma. But that fear and all the gifts and things that I had, spiritual gifts, it was such a variety of them, and 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 then when the the visions and things, I didn't want to see that no more because there was nobody in my life that could explain it to me. And the young people in the church, and even some of the older people, they just were afraid of me, so they didn't even want to see me coming. They called me all sorts of things, the death angel and uh, the grim reaper and stuff. So I was just a uh, outcast at a young age so i asked god to uh, i said please don't let me see visions anymore i don't want to do this it was a burden so then after that the anxiety got worse because then i started having dreams then the dream would come true it was like i i got to be crazy and then like I say, on the old video, I was just a wreck. I'd be so afraid my children would die in their sleep and got so bad. They, uh, back then, I don't know how it is now, you didn't have to see a psychiatrist to get antidepressants. Your uh, primary care doctor could give you that kind of medication. And me and my ex-husband, we had some of the best insurance, so... They would, they would give me all sorts of ephedra. That's what they were giving out back then. And I saw a piece of paper uh, giving me all my medications that I took since uh, 2013. There were so many antidepressants on there. And I said, dog, I have really been going through with the anxiety and stuff. But what made it not as bad was the fact that I was working and the fact that I'm doing something it it makes it not as bad but now that I'm uh, older and just disabled to a certain extent I can't do anything much and you just sit here and think 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 and get depressed 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 and like I say uh, uh, February of this year I lost my, my oldest son passed away, but I told him and his wife and the family members, we were just talking and I didn't know, I, I forgot about me telling them about a dream I had. And I, and I was just saying, you know, that usually means that somebody's going to die when I have a dream about me talking on the phone to somebody who is dead. And that particular night, I dreamed about somebody who was dead. And my oldest son said, oh, mama, I hope that's not me. I said, oh, no, that's not you. And that was on his birthday, February the 7th. And then on February the 11th, he was dead. And I, and that set me way back, back into anxiety, 
with the dreams and stuff. I said, God, I, I don't want no dreams. I don't want nothing. Just take it all from me. But Harold was telling me it's fear, and we have got to rebuke fear. And I just want to, this chapter, it's chapter five. I'm going to try to see if he could uh, come on. He may not be able to come and uh, talk uh, on on camera, but maybe I could get his voice on the phone because uh, he, he's dealing with some health issues too. So, but he I, he might be able to come if he feel like it. He's he's real shy. Once we get him to talk, and he'll be okay. But I hope this this thing about fear and anxiety will help somebody. But um. And in the first part of the chapter is talking about love, and we'll talk about that. But I'm I'm just gonna read this part a little bit about fear. It says death is not the biggest fear we have. Our biggest fear is taking the risk to be alive, the risk to be alive, and express what we really are. And that is so true. I have gotten myself in this rut and I, I'm not going to say that I manufactured my illness and so I don't, I can't do anything but when I was well I was busy meeting people and exchanging energy and helping people and they were helping me but now it's not, not like I'm afraid of dying but the risk to be alive it, it, it costs something to be alive. You have to do something to be alive. I mean, you could be in your bed and hide, and that's what I've been doing. It said, the risk to be alive and express what we really are. And I, I it's not that I, yeah, I know, yeah, I, I don't want to own up to the fact who I am. And the gifts that God has given me, because we all have the gifts, may not be the same gift, but when we recognize the gifts that we have, the thing about it, we shouldn't be afraid. Because God does not want us to be afraid. Fear not, even an angel said that, fear not. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So love and fear, they just don't go together. The next, uh, uh, let me see if I can show you how it's written. Let me turn it that way. You see where the asterisks are? That's how, it's just little short quotations. The next one says, when you fear anything, you will end up hating it. When your fear is gone, love is present. Love and fear cannot exist together. You yearn to say something loving, but you tighten up. This is fear. Fear is taught by all religious beliefs. This is here. This is said. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Second Timothy one and seven. Fear is bondage. Conquer fear and be free. Fear is self-created. God, the almighty source, did not program life for you to be filled with fear and sickness unto death. That is not the divine plan. That is yours. So I'm, I'm, I'm digging within myself. And like I say, this uh, anxiety and fear, I think it's fear that comes first. Fear causes the anxiety. So, to say that I'm addicted to doing it, and you know, if, it's hard to compare that to drugs, but it was always a reward when you were doing drugs, and I'm trying to figure out the reward of this addiction to fear. And I thought about it, and, you know, just take this kind of like a grain of salt. 
I'm looking at Sunny. She's really over there doing something. But take it like a grain of salt. But when I'm when I can't find somebody or they're not answering the phone or the kid, my son and his husband are out of pocket or I'm worried about something. I'm just, oh, worried, worried. And then when I find them, find out that they okay, that relief must be the reward that I yearn for. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's got to be some kind of reward for in an addiction because it's something that I'm longing for at the end. And and when I'm searching for, when I'm nervous, and I, I didn't notice until I started talking about it. And then something happened like uh, Saturday, no, su Sunday, Sundays. Something happened, my same old stuff. And then I was aware of what I was doing. I said, oh, there I go again. Stop, stop, stop. Don't even do that. Rebuke that thought. And then I still held on to it for a minute. And then when I they called, the people I was living for, they called. And then I tried to find that reward that I got. And I find out I, I was just, it was a false alarm. And I said, so that's what I've been looking for. That's what I, I enjoy when I found out, find out that I'm worried for nothing. It's like, oh, what a relief. So maybe that's, that's why I think the way I think, the anxiety, because when I was thinking about my children, how I would worry about them. And when they made it okay, or when the babies wasn't dead, see, it didn't kill them. Just that relief, because it's tense. You, I'm tense the whole time. But uh, the medication... I don't, I'm, I'm just on one medication now, uh, acetylopram, but I was on something else, two of them, and one of them was making me real depressed, so I stopped taking that, but I want to uh, not take the medication and just get rid of the anxiety naturally, because if I call out what it is and rebuke it and tell myself, don't be afraid, it's okay, then it goes away and if it come back again we got to do the same thing because you take the uh pills i acetylopram i take it three times a day as needed so now i can do it as needed i can pray and meditate and rebuke these thoughts that's what it is but i'm kind of on 22 minutes but i could just go on and on about this book man and it, it talks about love, love and fear, but I'm not going to skip around, but this is an amazing book. That's all I can say. And it's here to tell you about the chapters. Let me turn around so you can see it. With the holy right. <laughs> My, I'm me and this camera. But that's the way it's set up. The concept of God. And it's telling you the concept of God, what, what God is. And a lot of people might not understand this. And it is, it tells you who God is. And this is amazing, but we don't take it slow. And cause like I say, this is healing for me. And this channel, I started just for, for my healing. And if somebody else get healed on the way, because one of my members, my subscribers, was telling me some things, uh, you know, a little short uh, sentence. And she, she she made me understand. It was like an epiphany, like, whoa, that's me addicted to anxiety and fear. Hmm. So now that I'm aware of what I'm doing to myself, I know what to work on. So... I'll, I'll get better. I know I am because I'm working on it. You guys uh, help me and uh, pray for me and think about me. And we all have room to examine things that we are afraid of. So anyway, I'm going I'm to do uh, some meditation and some reading. Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The thing I've been thinking about, where is the secret place of the Most High? And I'm thinking about that and just trying to go in my heart because nobody knows where that place is but me. And the key is for me to remember where that secret place is. So I'm going to say goodnight, guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye.